Ryanair plane flying from Greece to Lithuania was diverted to Minsk in Belarus and a dissident Belarusian journalist on board was detained. Belarusian authorities ordered what European leaders call a state-sponsored hijacking. Well, it's been a month now since a Ryanair plane with 132 people on board was essentially hijacked over Belarus and forced to land at Minsk airport. The hijacking was ordered by Belarus's leader, Alexander Lukashenko, who is sometimes referred to as Europe's last dictator. Well, Lukashenko and his people claimed there was a bomb on board the plane, but nothing was found. Uh, what actually happened was Lukashenko's agents forcibly removed and arrested these two passengers before letting the plane continue its journey. It's an astounding story, which one European leader called an unprecedented act of state terrorism that cannot go unpunished. It's being called the biggest political crisis for global aviation in years. There's been a chorus of condemnation across Europe after a Ryanair plane flying from Greece to Lithuania was diverted to Minsk in Belarus. For security reasons, we recommend you to land. State media in Belarus said the plane was forced to land because of a bomb scare. Belarus state media reported that President Alexander Lukashenko himself ordered a MiG-29 fighter jet to escort the aircraft down. The plane landed, but it was clear there was no bomb. This was a case of state-sponsored hijack and state-sponsored piracy. What do we know about why this plane was diverted? Well, because it was carrying a prominent opposition blogger, activist. Roman Prokosievich was arrested on landing in Minsk and he could face charges that carry the death penalty. Sofia Sapagan was arrested with Protasevich and is believed to be his girlfriend. Roman Protasevich, what more can you tell us about uh, this individual? Well, he's one of the founders of the very popular blog Nectar. The Nectar uh, telegram channel was absolutely key um, in the organization of that uh, protest movement that exploded last August after the presidential election, which Alexander Lukashenko is widely thought to have cheated. He's considered to be like private and of uh, Lukashenko. Alexander Lukashenko has been Belarus president since 1994, a leader described in some quarters as Europe's last dictator. Lukashenko and his regime have to understand that uh, this will have severe consequences. We have adopted today the largest package of sanctions with Canada, UK and US. We are following through and holding the regime accountable. Please, world, stand up and help I beg you so much because they will kill him. They will kill him. Well, that was Roman Protasevich's mother there ending that report, clearly worried about her son. Let's focus on him now. And the Belarusian journalist turned activist is just 26 years old, born in 1995. He's known no leader other than Alexander Lukashenko who came to power a year before he was born. For the past couple of years, Roman has helped run a Belarusian media outlet called Neta, reporting on human rights abuses and corruption in Belarus, and it pulls no punches when it comes to President Lukashenko. Inside the scheme, plans, documents, evidence, facts, and full facts are the life of dictator. Well, Roman calculated that eventually he'd be arrested, and he left the country in 2019. But he carried on running Neta from neighboring Poland, as editor-in-chief, he ensured it covered and coordinated the unprecedented anti-Lukashenko protests last summer related to the presidential election, which is believed to have been rigged. Protasevich then moved to Lithuania's capital, Vilnius, late last year, after a disagreement with colleagues at Nieta. And now, Roman and his girlfriend, Sofia Sapega, are in jail in Belarus, facing perhaps a 15-year prison sentence. Well, let's bring in our guest now. And Franak Viakorka is the chief advisor to Belarus's most prominent opposition leader, Svetlana Sikonouskaya. And since the election, they've lived in self-imposed exile in Lithuania. Also in Lithuania, we have Maximus Milter, head of communications at European Humanities University, uh, which Sofia attends as a law student. And finally, to talk about aviation safety, we have the industry expert, Alex Macheras, who is in London. Welcome to all three of you. Maximus, it's been a month now since that uh, 
essentially a, a state-sponsored kidnapping in some people's eyes. And we have uh, young uh, Roman in a prison in, uh, in Belarus, along with his girlfriend. Uh, what do we know about their condition one month on? Well, first, it's crucial to highlight that the conditions that both Sofia and Roman are experiencing, they're not unique in this regard. We are talking about uh, 502 political prisoners who are held as effectively hostages these days in Belarus by the regime of Alexander Lukashenko. And when it comes particularly to Sofia and Raman, they are held in KGB prison, located right in the center of Minsk. And though in terms of infra infrastructure, this is, these are probably not the most severe conditions one may find in terms of the prisons overall Belarus, although lagging far beyond the standards of penitentiary institutions as we can find them in Europe, still, uh, the lack of access to their lawyers, uh, the absence of any possibility to communicate with the outer world, the lack of access to free information, that is uh, the conditions they are experiencing. And uh, so far, though, it has been over a month already since Sofia yeah. has been kidnapped. There was only a chance to receive just one letter by her mother. And we see that, of course, uh, the charges that are brought up against her as against the Roman, they have nothing in common with the common sense and the reality. Just expand upon that. What are the, cha are the charges, or what you know about them, and why do you believe they have they have no bearing on reality? Of course. Uh, well, we can start with talking about Sofia. Sofia is a fifth-year student of international law and European Union law program at the European Humanities University, which also is a Belarusian university in exile, located here in Vilnius, Lithuania, since Alexander Lukashenko has shut the down university 16 years ago. And Sofia has been one of the most brightest students of her class. She's been writing her thesis, um, and uh, she was just about to defend the thesis uh, soon after arrival uh, from, from, from Greece, where she had a break just before uh, defending the thesis. And the charges that are brought against her, in particular, organizing of mass riots and the inflaming of, um, uh, of ethnic violence, they are, well, it, it, it's impossible to address them with the sense of logic and with the sense of, with, with just uh, any adequate uh, sort of uh, assessment. Because uh, Sofia, uh, as not only myself, I know her, but also her course mates and group mates, as the supervisors of her thesis, faculty members, they all know her as a brilliant student. She has a brilliant reputation across the university and wider community. And she has nothing in common with the alleged charges that are brought up against her. Right. And likewise, but, we see the same story turning out with Roman. Is it the same story with Roman, though? I mean, Fran, if you could pick up on that point. I mean, he's, he's a well-known journalist. Uh, he, he helped to run Neta. And with that uh, site, he helped to... Well, to inform and coordinate uh, protests in, in Belarus. So, uh, presumably, Lukashenko actually has very good reason to get him, at least. Oh, definitely Roman was the personal enemy for Lukashenko, because since protests started in, in August, Roman was taking active part in, in um, giving people information. He was gathering videos, uh, photos, information from, uh, from people on the ground. And uh, he was trying to tell the truth. Uh, for several months, he was in Warsaw, then he moved to Vilnius. And in Vilnius, um, uh, he, he started to work more on explaining people what's happening on the ground, what's happening in politics. He was explaining the real um, uh, reasons why Lukashenko is so aggressive and so severe towards his own citizens. And this hijacking of the plane and kidnapping of Roman, it was on one hand personal uh, revenge of Lukashenko to journalists and Roman personally, but on the other hand, it was the message to uh, democratic forces like, look, no matter where you are, I can get you everywhere. You are under threat. I follow you. I monitor you. And this was also the message to European Union, like, I don't care about your laws, about your rules. Yeah. I can do whatever you want and you can't uh, respond to me. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, let's just pick up on the fact that, uh, you know, Roman is, what, 25, 26 years of age, and this, you know, this very imposing leader that he's going up against has been there in power for longer than he's been alive. Um, just explain how he became so prominent that Lukashenko was willing to risk an international outrage to get his hands on him. Uh, I think the new generation of Belarusians with access to the internet, traveling uh, around the world, they don't leave, they don't want to live under Lukashenko's dictatorship. Lukashenko is the Soviet-type leader. He is man from the past. 
and the new people, people who saw the world, who saw the life in Europe, they just uh, want changes. Uh, and Raman is one of them, one of uh, thousands and perhaps millions of Belarusians, young Belarusians, who want changes. And uh, I remember Raman when he was an activist, he was participated in silent protests 10 uh, years ago. Then he turned to journalist and he was uh, um, working for European Radio for Belarus, Radio Free Europe. And then he moved to Telegram. Telegram became the only space where people can get free, unbiased, uh, uncensored information. And uh, in, on Telegram, Roman actually made his career and Roman, Roman became perhaps not the face, but one of the leaders of the uh, yeah. street protests. Oh, what's extraordinary is that uh, obviously Roman and other dissidents know not to go back to, to Belarus, but they could never have imagined that someone would go so far as to stop a plane in midair, bring it down into uh, Belarus, and then, I mean, uh, Alex, is, is this a, a unique example? We've heard of planes being shot down before, but being forced down? It's unprecedented. You're quite right to imply that, not least because this was a flight, a, a European summer leisure flight that was flying between two EU states on an Irish airline, Ryanair a household name across the world, not least just in Europe. And so to have Ryanair caught up in such an incident whereby this exact incident has now set what could be a precedent in that perhaps people who are perhaps wanted or engaging in activism against states, that those states would quite like to, to, to have them in their custody for one reason or another, yeah. should now be very careful as to whether or not their flights are overflying those regions in the first place. You know, wow. for overflight, we know that it's very safe to fly over regions where there is conflict or where there are elements of war and disputes. So this has really shaken the international well, air that, travel community. That, you're absolutely right, Alex, because you can imagine, look around the world and put a little flag in all the countries who would like to get their hands on dissidents. And actually, that's, oh, I don't know, maybe a closely a majority of countries, right? So well, you can just imagine what Saudi Arabia, what China, what all of these other countries may have been thinking when they watched this unfold, because this was a very well-coordinated attack onto this aircraft. And there are several breaches that are now being explored in mm. international aviation law, which is governed by ICAO. That's the UN body for aviation. But the key part to remember here is that I don't think we will see much come out of it because there is no real enforcement for ICAO, for the UN body that governs international freedom of the skies, those air laws. It really is going to be up to the individual countries and to the trade blocs right. like the European right. Union. Oh, Franek, um, obviously you work as the chief advisor to Belarus's most prominent opposition uh, candidate. And that must give you pause for thought about whether you should fly over Belarus or in other countries maybe who are friendly to uh, Alexander Lukashenko. Uh, actually, right now, at this moment, I'm in the Vilnius airport and uh, we just landed from Brussels, where Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya has met leadership of European Commission, European Council, and also uh, spoke yesterday at the meeting of uh, foreign affairs ministers of the EU. And we actually discussed today how the flight is, uh, is flying and which territories it's flying over. And now uh, I must say that each time we, we choose the path, we, we are thinking uh, about security and not only about security of Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya personally, but about security of all our team. So basically right now, uh, Lukashenko reached his goal. He made us feeling insecure. He made us feeling in danger. Uh, thanks to Lithuania and Poland, uh, additional security was given to democratic uh, Belarus offices in, in uh, Warsaw and, and uh, Vilnius, but perhaps that's not enough. We, are, um, we have the, the hostile uh, state, hostile government, uh, which um, weaponized um, its uh, diplomatic uh, connections, its diplomatic presences in different countries, and uh, which, uh, in order to threaten and to uh, pressurize its political opponents. This is why only sanctions, uh, only uh, strong, prompt uh, reply from the international community, not only from ICAO, but also from such institutions as, as the European Union and United Nations, um, uh, can, can uh, stop the problem, can prevent the escalation and the scaling of such problem to other regions. Uh, Maximus, just to pick up on the point about uh, sanctions, international pressure 
on Belarus. Uh, from what you've seen so far, uh, will these sanctions make any difference uh, to Lukashenko's behavior and perhaps the fate of Roman and his girlfriend? The only language that regimes like the one of Alexander Lukashenko understand and comprehend is the language of power. And uh, so far, uh, the four sanction packages that were adopted by the European Union still, in terms of the outreach of physical entities, meaning people that are listed on those lists and also uh, the list of companies, they are hardly comparable to the scale of impunity that continues in Belarus, because what happens these days in Belarus is the largest scale of political repressions on the European continent since the regime of black colonels in Greece. So we're talking about close to 40,000 people detained since August last year. We talk about more than 3,000 criminal cases being opened, and mine already mentioned uh, 502 political prisoners. So we are highly anticipating the sectoral economic sanctions that are due to be released on uh, Thursday evening or Friday morning. And this probably will be a very tangible step forward right. in regards to putting pressure on Lukashenko's regime and, most importantly, raising the costs of this regime to carry on. It is essential to underline that historically those examples that illustrate to us that sanctions can be uh, functional, that can be successful, they bring us back, for example, to the regime of apartheid that, he's, that has been brought down only due to sanctions that were both resilient and consistent. So far, we the sanctions policy of the West, it looks more like a patchwork. It is welcoming that it increases the pressure, but so far it hasn't been sufficient mm -hmm. enough. So the sectoral sanctions in regards to potash industry, in regards to oil products, in regards to provision of financial services, these are very important steps forward and they should be increased proportionally because as long as political prisoners are there kept hostages in Belarus, there can be no other dialogue or no other way rather than increasing the costs of running this bloody regime in Belarus. Right. I mean, we did invite uh, somebody from the Lukashenko regime or government uh, to appear on the show. Unfortunately, they didn't get back to us, as you pretty much can expect. Uh, so let's hear from... Alexander Lukashenko himself now. This soundbite we're about to hear is from just a couple of days after the plane was ordered to land in Minsk. Let's have a listen. Думал о безопасности страны. Я действовал законно, защищая своих людей. Так будет и впредь. Наши недоброжелатели извне, да и внутри страны, изменили методы атаки на государство. Они приступили множество красных линий, uh, so, Alex, you'll be aware of Alexander Lukashenko's uh, reasoning, stated reasoning, for uh, ordering the plane to land in Minsk. Uh, he, he and others were saying that it was a bomb on board and perhaps Hamas was involved. Uh, obviously, you don't give that any credibility wha whatsoever. No, and neither does the international aviation community. I think not only is it quite clear what has happened, again, I will take us back to, you know, uh, looking at a similar kind of incident had it been in another area of the world, whereby, of course, Article 1 of the Chicago Convention means that if a state needs to close its airspace suddenly in the name of security or inform other aircraft above the area to, to land immediately citing security, they are within their right to do so, but to target a specific aircraft and then to breach Article 1 by ultimately risking the lives of those on board in order to facilitate what was a very rushed, forced diversion of a civilian airliner jet, a, a Boeing 737 belonging to passenger airline Ryanair, you can imagine their reaction. Yeah. Not only are there several breaches being explored, but also, again, it's just protecting that precedent that, has, as one of your guests has already said, has sadly already been set. Yeah. Let's have a quick listen to one of the passengers uh, from that plane uh, describing uh, what they saw and heard as they were ordered to go down into Minsk. At one moment, we just uh, change uh, the direction of flight and we go down and then to the left. Uh, after, let's say, Two and a half minutes, uh, the captain of the crew and crew said that we're going to land in uh, Minsk. It explained that we're going to land to Minsk because of uh, some technical reasons. Uh, the, nobody said that any information like uh, that it's some uh, terroristic uh, attack or a bomb or something. 
Alex, obviously the uh, passengers were either confused or extremely worried uh, or a mixture of the two. What about the pilot? Are they trained for this kind of thing? They do train for, for protocols within the framework of the airlines in terms of diverting in the name of security and bomb threats. But again, this didn't play out anything like anything the flight crew will have trained for, because in these very rushed moments, they were deciding, do we follow the instructions of the state we are now overflying? And should Belarus have had any doubt as to whether or not Ryanair were going to continue the journey and perhaps buy some time to find out what was going on? They sent up their military to intimidate that flight crew. Also, we know that Ryanair, the airline, were never involved ordinarily in a usual bomb threat or a security risk to an airliner. Those flight crew, the pilots, will have been communicating with our airline back at home, along with air traffic control, just to make sure that all is what is seems in those very tense moments while they're trying to make that assessment. Of course, this was a coordinated attack onto this aircraft, whereby they knew they wanted to ramp up the pressure. They had these military jets escorting the aircraft down, and the flight crew, knowing that they are subject to the law of the land that they are overflying, followed the instructions. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Ryanair. The CEO, Michael O'Leary, had a few choice words to say about this. This was a case of state-sponsored, it was a state-sponsored hijack, it was state-sponsored piracy. I think it was very frightening for the crew, for the passengers um, who were held under armed guard, had their bags searched. Um, when it was clear, it appears that the intent of the authorities was to uh, remove a journalist and his traveling companion. Uh, and, you know, we believe there was also some uh, KGB agents offloaded off the aircraft as well. Uh, Maximus, uh, we have uh, Michael O'Leary there, the CEO of Ryanair, uh, saying that he suspected there were KGB agents on board helping to direct this entire operation. Have you heard anything about that? Well, the assessment of uh, KGB presence on board, it varies. There is a number of countries that are currently investigating the case, and there is a criminal case open, an investigation open by Prosecutor General of Lithuania. There are also investigations taking place in Poland, so probably we'll see for more in-depth reporting on that account. However, Raman himself, he has reported to his affiliates just before embarking the plane in the form of a joke. It seemed to him that he's been followed, and he has described the person who has been following him and tried to take a picture of his ID and his uh, ticket. And later, it has all evolved quite dramatically, as we can figure out. And most dramatic part of this is that the flight itself, it was just on the, uh, on the immediate distance from Lithuania, less than 20 kilometers away from the physical border of Lithuania, and it has been diverted back to, back to Minsk, with, Minsk with the help of the fighter jet and also the helicopters that have been put in air. And Lukashenko claimed his own responsibility for ordering this uh, the, uh, the, uh, these vehicles to, put, to be put in, in the air. Uh, Franek, we're coming towards the end of the show. It's, it's very important to look to the future here. Um, it does appear that Lukashenko, uh, despite what happened over the summer, those protests, which were unprecedented in scale and size, it does look like he has a very strong position still, still has the backing of Russia. He's able to act, it appears, with almost impunity. Uh, tell me, what is the future of the opposition? What's the future of Belarus? Uh, so, first of all, uh, Lukashenko is in opposition because uh, last year Belarusians voted for changes, voted for Tikhanovsky. These elections were rigged. And right now, Lukashenko is cleaning it up to power. He wants to buy some time. He wants to stay in power. He wants to find a way out, perhaps, for himself and for, for his family. So, in order to sustain, he uses violence against uh, uh, protesters, against the people, and he uses money in order to pay loyalists, in order to keep them loyal. And right now, when sanctions will be imposed, uh, Lukashenko will lose one of these two most important legs, money. And this can create some, some new dynamics, new momentum. But also, it can lead to the split of elites. And I hope that the protests, uh, peaceful protests, will return to Belarus streets. I also hope for a nationwide strike. But it will be possible only if the international community, the West, the European Union, will stay consistent, will not recognize Lukashenko, and will maximize economic pressure on himself, his cronies, his thugs. And also, it's very important to bring all perpetrators to justice. And finally, is there anything that you're trying to do or can do to help all the political prisoners, including Roman and Sofia? Uh, 
Absolutely. Maximum pressure from inside and from outside will release all political prisoners. I hope Rahman, Safiya and 500 others will get back safely um, uh, home uh, very soon. But I also hope that thousands, dozens of thousands of Belarusians who were forced to flee the country will be able to return home, such as Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, myself, perhaps Maxim as well. It's very important that uh, that all those who who, um, uh, who want to travel safely uh, to, to, to Belarus, they must be given such opportunity. But uh, in, in the current terrorizing, um, uh, with the current terrorizing regime, it will be very difficult. Franak Vyakorka, Maximus Milta, Alex Makaris, thank you all very much for your contributions to the Nexus today. And thank you at home and on your phones, as ever, for watching. Remember, if you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Till next week, then, goodbye. <laughs>